This is going to be the next episode of God's Game of Thrones. And if you haven't watched, go back and watch all these. It's about the kings of Israel and Judah. And you see, that's what the Bible is mainly about. It's about kings and kingdoms. And right now, uh, for a while, we've been just looking at Elijah and Elisha. Pretty soon, we'll be back into looking at more of the kings. And that's when I think it gets really interesting, is looking at those kings and what they did, what they said, how wicked some of them were, how good some of them were. Most of them were bad. But that's what this series mostly focuses on, is those kings. But right now, we're still looking at Elisha and some of the miracles that he did. And you know that he actually does double what Elijah did. And it says in 2 Kings 6, 1, And the sons of the prophets said unto Elijah, Behold now, the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. So the sons of the prophets are men who are being trained by Elisha. They are in prophet school. And their complaint is that the place where they are living is too straight. It's too narrow. It's not big enough. So they say, Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan. And take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. And he answered, Go ye. That's what Elisha said. He says, Go ye. So every man's going to take a beam. When they get there, they're going to take a beam and go build themselves a new place. Elijah seems to be all right with it because he says, You know, go, go ye. And one said, Be content, I pray thee, and go with thy servants. And he, Elijah, answered, I will go. And these young sons of the prophets know that they need to spend as much time with Elisha as they can, kind of like how Elisha wouldn't leave the side of Elijah. And Elijah could have went to the house and kicked back and let the young guys handle it, handle it all and build it all. But he knows if you're going to help the young guys, you have to go down low like they are. Go down where they are. Don't just sit back and talk about how rough you used to have it. Like most older men do now. I, I don't talk much. I observe how people operate. And the young guys come in and they start training the older guys. They start acting like they know so much more than the older guys. And then the older guys, they don't do any training. They don't try to help the young guys. They just sit back and pridefully talk about how much harder they had it. And how this new generation isn't any good. Well, if the new generation is not any good and yours is better, then you need to start training that generation how to be better. Not just sit back and talking about how much better you are. <clears throat> you see, they both got problems. The young guy thinks he knows everything. The old guy thinks he's just so much better many times. If they would... if the You see, the, the young man is supposed to use his strength... And the the old guy's got his wisdom. The young guy today is too lazy to use his strength. And a lot of the old guys never got any wisdom. So that's why we're in such a mess. But in Second uh, Kings 6, 4, it says, So he went with them, and when they came to Jordan, they cut down wood. You see, they were learning about spiritual things from Elijah, but at the same time, the ministry is also about physical things and physical work. So they weren't just all talk. They said they were going to go get to work, and that's what they did. And the topic I want to talk about is losing your edge. You don't want to lose your edge. And now one of them is about to lose their edge. It says in Second Kings 6, 5, but as one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. So this guy was trying to cut down this tree, and his axe head flew off and went into the water. And the worst thing about it to him was that it was borrowed. This young man probably didn't have enough money to go replace the axe. And being son, a son of the prophets, he would know that he would need to replace it because in Exodus twenty two fourteen it says, And if a man borrow aught of his neighbor, and it be hurt or die, the owner thereof, being not with it, he shall surely make it good. 
So at least this young guy had enough character to have the intentions of returning the axe when he was done or replacing it if he broke it. Another good characteristic is the guy was upset about losing the axe. A lot of guys would have been happy. They could have been done working for the day. You know, a lot of people are happy when something tears up. That way they can just go home. But this young guy was wanting to work. So, that's some good characteristics about him, but Elisha is going to do something. It says in Second Kings 6 and verse 6, And the man of God, Elijah, said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither. And the iron did swim. So this, this kid lost his edge, but the prophet helped him get it back. You see, the axe head can be a picture of you. You were borrowed by the world. Just like that axe was borrowed, you were borrowed by the world. You see, there was a day before you reached the knowledge of good and evil. There was a day when you were a little child, you were safe if you died. You hadn't been saved yet, but since you hadn't reached that knowledge of good and evil, you were safe. You were in the Lord's hands. But then one day you realized you had broke the commands of an almighty God and that you were a sinner and you died spiritually. Just like Paul says, when I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. And the world borrowed you for a little while. And then you... Maybe you went to church, or like me, you were just, you just happened to hear a sermon on the internet, and the preacher shook the stick at you. You heard the gospel and got saved. You were redeemed. The axe head underwater can be a picture of you being dead in your sins. The preacher, Elijah, says, where fell it? That can be a picture of the soul winner saying, what caused you to fall? And the answer would be your sin. Uh... You lost your edge, the axe head. It went down in that water. Uh, the preacher showed you your guilt of sin. He said, where fell it? And then he threw the stick in, and you got saved. You see, Elijah cutting down and throwing in the stick can be a picture of the soul winner introducing you to Jesus Christ because do you know what Jesus is called? He's called the branch. And the branch was cut off. In Isaiah 11, 1, it says, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch, capital B, shall grow out of his roots. The branch is Jesus. In Isaiah 53, 8, it says, He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his, gener this, his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living, for the transgression of my people was he stricken. The branch was cut off. In Daniel 9, 26, it says, And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Jesus, the branch, was cut off. He was crucified. This can picture the Father <clears throat> receiving you into the family. You see, Jesus, in, Gen uh, in 2 Kings 6, 7, it says, Therefore said he, Take it up to thee, talking about the axe head. And the young prophet, he put out his hand and he took it. And this can, like I said, this can be the, a picture of the father receiving you into the family. Jesus took your hand and took the father's hand and brought them, brought them together. Elijah brought the axe head and the guy who was using it back together. So the guy who lost the axe head because it fell off can picture the father losing you when you reach the age of accountability, Elijah can picture the soul winner or the preacher who throws Jesus into the picture and preaches Jesus Christ and him crucified. And then the stick can picture Jesus Christ, the branch, who led the sinner back to the hand of God. Now for another picture. Remember that Israel is God's axe. In Jeremiah 51.20 it says, The Lord says, Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee will I destroy kingdoms. So Israel is God's battle axe, and Israel falls through their rebellion and idolatry. 
They are the axe head that falls. They lose their edge. They lost their edge because of their rebellion and idolatry. Just like the axe head fell off the handle, Israel falls. But remember that Israel gets restored just as the axe head gets restored. So the axe head pictures Israel primarily falling and being restored. In 2 Kings 6, 8, it says, Then the king of Syria warred against Israel and took counsel with his servants, saying, In such and such a place shall be my camp. And this will be uh, Syria's ambush position against Israel. This is the enemy here, Syria. But now I want to really get into the topic. And the topic is how not to lose your edge. And the first point is, if you don't want to lose your edge, beware there is an enemy. In 2 Kings 6, 9, it says, And the man of God sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware. There's that word I'm using. Beware that thou pass not such a place. For tither the Syrians are come down. So Elijah gives the location of the Syrians to the king of Israel. You see, the preacher can warn you of coming danger. Because he has a Bible that tells him all about it. So when he gets up and says, Beware, there is an enemy. Um, don't make the preacher your enemy. Just because he's telling you the truth. You see, that's his job. He's supposed to get up and tell you to beware of an enemy. Paul said in Galatians 4.16, Am I therefore become your enemy? Because I tell you the truth. You see, your main enemy is most likely going to be your flesh. You need to be aware, be aware, beware of giving it everything it wants. And a good indicator that a desire is a fleshy, fleshly desire is if it benefits you. Not, not every time, but most times. You see, the Spirit leads you to do things that benefit God first, others second, and then you in the long run. You see, your flesh desires things that instantly benefits itself. So your number one enemy is your flesh. You need to beware of your flesh. You have other enemies, unclean spirits, the devil, false teachers. You need to beware. You need to know where, they are, where they're at. You need to know what they're doing, what their plans are. Uh, are they trying to ambush you? You see, Elijah was aware of the enemy. So he told the king of Israel. And it says in 2 Kings 6.10... And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of and saved himself there not once nor twice. So the king of Israel at this time is Jehoram. And this can get kind of confusing because there are actually two guys named Jehoram reigning at the same time. But in 2 Kings one seventeen, it shows us that this Jehoram, it says, So he died according to the word according to the word of the Lord, which Elijah had spoken, and Jehoram reigned in his stead in the second year of Jehoram, the son of Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, because he had no son. So you have two Jehorams reigning at the same time. That can get kind of confusing. <clears throat> but the king of Israel at this time is Jehoram, and it says that he saved himself there not once nor twice. When it says not once nor twice, that's saying, you know, several times he saved himself. You know, it was more than once or twice. So several times he saved himself by listening to the warning of the prophet who was simply giving him what God said. You see, you save yourself not once nor twice, but many times over and over again just by doing what the Bible says, just by doing what the preacher said when he gave you what the Bible said, saying, beware, there is an enemy. So you save yourself. You don't lose your edge. When you, when you listen to the Bible, you listen to the preacher, they'll keep your edge sharpened. They'll keep your edge on the handle. In 1 Timothy 4.16, it says, Take heed unto thyself and unto the doctrine. Continue in them. For in doing this thou shalt both save thyself and them that hear thee. You just continue in the doctrine, the right doctrine, the sound doctrine. In 2 Kings 6, 11, it says, Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me 
which of us is for the king of Israel? Of course, when you don't let the enemy win, he's going to be sore troubled. If you do let him win, then you'll be sore troubled. You see, the king of Israel, or the king of Syria, is sore troubled for this thing. And he says to his servants, will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? He thinks there is someone in his camp who's for the king of Israel. And like acting as a spy and telling their location to the king of Israel. He doesn't understand how this happened. How did they know where we were? In Second Kings six twelve, it says, And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Somehow a servant of the king of Syria knows all about Elijah. Maybe he heard him preach on the radio or something. But he spills the beans and he lets the enemy king know that Elijah is giving away their location. You see, Elijah knew by the help of the Lord what the king was saying in his own bedchamber. Uh, there wasn't any eavesdropping. There wasn't any secret recording devices planted in there in the king of Syria's bedroom. It was the Lord that told Elijah. You see, you better watch what you're saying at all times, even when you're alone. The Lord hears it. The devil hears it. Unclean spirits hear it. Your neighbors may even hear it. Ecclesiastes 10.20 says, Curse not the king, no, not in thy thought, and curse not the rich in thy bedchamber, for a bird of the air shall carry the voice, and that which hath wings shall tell the matter. You're never really alone. There's always somebody listening, whether it be a spirit or somebody that you don't know is there. In 2 Kings 6.13, it says, And he said, Go and spy where he is. This is the king of Syria talking... <clears throat> To his men about Elijah, he says, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. So he, spent, he, he sent out a spy to find Elijah. Probably some kind of stealth, ninja-like, 007 expert to come in there and try, try to find out where Elijah's at. But the funny thing is that Elijah probably knew that he was hiding in the bushes and in the hay and in the barn and under a chariot, wherever the spy was hiding. I mean, if he knew what the king was saying in his bedchamber, I doubt that this spy is going to come in there undetected. And if he, you see, if he heard what the king's saying, he probably can sense this guy watching him. In 2 Kings 6, 14, it says, Therefore sent he tither horses and chariots, and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. So the king of Syria sends a bunch of people. He's sending all these people to go after one prophet. You see, it's almost as if they know that Elijah does serve the one and only true and all-powerful God. Why send all these people just for one man? But why fear a great host? Like the Syrians here. Why fear horses and chariots? Chariots break down. Horses get spooked. And a great host is made up of sinful men that die off. But God lives forever. And he has horses and chariots that never die or break down. In Psalm 3 and verse 6, it says, I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me round about. You see, beware there is an enemy. But you need to realize that they can't do nothing if you got God. In 2 Kings 6, 15, And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And his servant said unto him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? So Elisha's servant gets up, looks out the window, and sees all those guys on their horses and chariots. He's scared to death and asks Elijah, what are we going to do? We're outnumbered. And in 2 Kings 6, 16, And he answered, This is Elijah, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. You see, Elijah knew that no matter how many people was coming against him, he always had the upper hand. He had God, for one thing. But then God just, just for 
for the kicks, I guess, has thousands and thousands and thousands of angels that he lets come down to, even though he doesn't need them. And it says in Romans 8, 31, what shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? See, if God's for you, what's the people of Syria? And Deuteronomy 32, 30, it says, how should one chase a thousand and two put 10,000 to flight? except the rock had sold them and the Lord shut them up. In 2 Chronicles 32, 7 through 8, it says, Be strong and courageous. Be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. For there be more with us than with him. With him is an arm of flesh. But with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. And the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. You see... Your enemy has an arm of flesh. But we have the Lord to fight our battles. Elijah was on another level. He saw what his servant couldn't see. And he probably knew about the spies all along. He probably knew the chariots were coming all along. He probably slept like a baby that night. And then got up and had his coffee and, and a coffee cake. And when that army was rattling the coffee out of the cup he probably picked it up and took a couple sips out of it so it wouldn't spill in his wide margin scroll that he was reading the word of god out of you see he wasn't scared at all if you put your hand on his chest his heart would just barely be beating probably but beware there is an enemy if you don't want to lose your edge beware there is an enemy but the next point is behold you have allies Beware there is an enemy, but behold, you have allies. In 2 Kings 6, 17, it says, And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elijah. It says, Behold, there's our word, Behold, you have allies. And the servant's eyes opened, and he could see the horses and chariots of fire. If you're going to see the things of God, then you have to have your eyes opened. The Lord himself has to reveal to you the scriptures. You could be a genius and read the Bible a hundred times and not really get it. A born-again praying, believing, Bible-believing hillbilly from Tennessee who never even graduated high school can read it once and get more than the genius could because the Lord has to reveal to you the scriptures. He has to open your eyes. And the servant had his eyes opened, and he saw horses and chariots, horses of fire, to be exact. The enemies just had regular horses. Imagine the horsepower of those horses of fire from the Lord. Elijah was used, he, Elijah was used to hanging around these powerful creatures. Remember, he saw them come down and pick up Elijah back in 2 Kings 2.11. Elijah and his servant greatly outnumbered the enemy because they had the Lord. One man and God is the majority. But also, Hebrews 12, 22 shows you that the Lord also has an innumerable company of angels. In Daniel 12, 1, it says, And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince which standeth for the children of thy people. Elijah had the Lord, he had a numerable company of angels, and he had Michael the archangel on his side. So that's greatly outnumbering the people of Syria. But behold, you have allies. If you don't want to lose your edge, remember that you're not in this alone. You have allies. Your best friend is Jesus. If you start thinking you can lead him or don't need him, then you'll lose your edge. You'll start losing your spiritual eyes. You'll start losing your spiritual discernment. And that leads to the next point. When you lose your edge, you go blind and can't cut. When you've lost your edge, you can't take your weapon and chop away at the enemy. You can't see the enemy. You may not even know that you're talking to the enemy. And this is what happened with these men of Syria. They didn't even realize that they were talking to the man they were looking for. In 2 Kings 16, 18, it says, And when they came down to him, to Elijah, Elijah prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. 
and he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elijah. See, I imagine Elijah was so calm that he didn't even look up from his wide margin scroll. He just took a sip of coffee and said, Get them, Lord. And, and the Lord just struck them all with blindness. And Elijah doesn't need an attack, an attack dog. He's got the Lord. So while they were struck with blindness, Elijah tricks them. It says in verses 19 through 20, And Elijah said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. Well, they were seeking Elijah, but he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass when they were coming to Samaria that Elijah said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes, and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. You see, Elijah, the prophet, he knew how to get your eyes blinded and how to get your eyes open. And that can picture how if you really get in the book, you know how to open somebody's eyes to things, let the Lord use you to open people's eyes to things. But at the same time, you would know enough to blind somebody as well because you don't just know the right doctrine you've studied all the bad doctrine too for example uh, you've studied the right doctrine you've got sound doctrine but you've took the time to learn all the bad doctrine the church of christ stuff the, the catholic cult stuff you could blind somebody if you wanted to but you can also open their eyes. The Lord can use you to open their eyes because you know the right doctrine. See, Elijah had that power. Samaria is where the king of Israel is. So Elijah has led them right into the midst of their enemy. He led them right into the fortification of Israel. It says in 2 Kings 6.21, And the king of Israel said unto Elijah, When he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? You see, the king of Israel is so intimidated by Elijah that he calls Elijah, My father out of respect. He wants to know that if he should smite these guys or not. The answer he gets from Elijah is no. It says in 2 Kings 6.22, And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them. Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with the sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink and go to their master. Showing kindness to the captive soldiers could have led them to God. And Elijah pictures Jesus Christ who is kind to his enemies. It says in Romans 2, 4, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? See, by being good to somebody, you can actually lead them the right way. And Elijah pictures the Lord that way. You've ha you have enemies, no need to fear them because of who your allies are. And your number one ally is the Lord himself. And the Lord loves his enemies. You were actually an enemy of God, but you got saved. 2 Kings 6.23, And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. So the bands of Syria came no more into the land of Israel. So beware, you have an enemy. And if you don't sharpen your weapon, you will lose your edge and fall into the snare of the devil. But also, behold, beware, behold, you have allies. And if you don't remember that God and his heavenly host are on your side, you'll lose confidence and you'll lose your edge. So beware, you have an enemy. Behold, you have allies. And next, bread alone. It's not enough. Jesus said, man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. Amos 8, 11 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So there is a famine of the word going on today, just like there was a famine of food going on back in this chapter. Second Kings 6.24 And it came to pass after this that Benadad, king of Syria, gathered all his host and went up and besieged Samaria. And there was a great famine in Samaria. And behold, they besieged it until an ass's head was sold for four score pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. 
that's pretty bad when people are so hungry that they're going to eat an ass's head. And that's what's going on today spiritually. There's a famine in the land of hearing the word of God. And behind pulpits everywhere, you have a big ass's head. He doesn't know which Bible is right. He uses an ESV, RSV, a NKJV. And he, he even then doesn't even really use the Bible. He just carries it around with him, I guess, to make him look more authoritative. But he doesn't use it either. You have behind pulpits everywhere a big ass's head. They do not care about the Bible. They stand in judgment of the Bible rather than trying to get people to have faith in it. But the people, they were selling dove's dung for five pieces of silver. And if they were going to eat the dove's dung, then they're really bad off. If they were just going to use it for fertilizer, then that's a little bit better, but they're still bad off. But today people have all kinds of bread, but the sin of Sodom, remember, was pride, fullness of bread, and abundance of idleness in Ezekiel 16.49. Bread alone is not enough. You have to get into the words of God and feast on those. If somebody isn't feeding it to you, then you must feed yourself. You need to feed yourself daily. So, that dove's dung. They're selling dove's dung. They're selling asses' heads. But that's a lot better when, than what Ezekiel was using to bake with. Because like in Ezekiel 4.12... It says, and thou shalt eat it as barley cakes, and thou shalt bake it with dung that cometh out of man in their sight. So it's better than what Ezekiel was using. But what is coming out of most men's mouth today who claim to be giving out the gospel? A bunch of dung. It isn't even dove's dung. But I, I wouldn't associate them with a dove because the dove is a picture of the Holy Spirit. And 2 Kings 6, 26 through 27, And as the king of Israel was passing by upon the wall, there cried a woman unto him, saying, Help, my lord, O king. And he said, If the lord do not help thee, whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor? Out of the wine press? You see, that's true. If the lord ain't helping her, then there's no way that he would be able to help her. Then he gets a little sarcastic and is like, Whence shall I help thee? Out of the barn floor, the wine press. He's being sarcastic because both of those places are empty during the famine. Verse 28, And the king said unto her, What aileth thee? And she answered, This woman said unto me, Give thy son that we may eat him today, and we will eat my son tomorrow. Things were getting so bad that they were resorting to cannibalism. This should remind you that no matter how bad it's gotten in your life, Surely you still haven't, you've not been tempted to eat your own children. So she says, so he boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, give thy son that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. So she gave her child for the, her and this woman to eat. And he's never coming back. Then she was supposed to give her child to eat, the other woman. But this other woman hides her son. She had a little bit more sense. Second Kings six thirty, and it came to pass when the king heard the words of the woman that he rent his clothes, and he passed by upon the wall, and the people looked, and behold, he had sackcloth within upon his flesh. So the king rent his clothes. And this doesn't mean he went and rented his clothes from a rental place. He didn't go rent some Nikes and Hey Dudes and PFG shirts and Columbia hats. He Rent his clothes. That means he he tore them. This is where you get the saying, he was all tore up. He was all tore up and put sackcloth on. He knew everybody was in rough shape. He didn't say, well, you can't help, you can't help what you want to eat. He didn't say, you know, everybody has a right to their own appetite. He didn't say, well, it's your right to kill and eat your own son. He wasn't that stupid. He knew that this place was in rough shape. But he was he was still quite stupid because look what he says next. In Second Kings 6.31, Then he said, God do so and more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. He doesn't blame anybody but Elisha. He should have blamed himself. 
But that's the next point. If you don't want to lose your edge, blame yourself and start sharpening. You see, the king should have looked at himself and saw what he could fix about himself that would have changed some things. You need to look at yourself. Put the blame on yourself and look at yourself and see what you can change. He was blaming Elijah. You see, things haven't changed. When bad things happen or doesn't go the way they want it, who do they blame? God's people. The real blame should have been on Ahab, the king's father, for not killing the king of Syria. But Jehoram should have realized that and blamed his own family. He should have started sharpening and turning his family around. But he's losing his edge. Second Kings 6.32 And Elijah sat in his house, and the elders sat with him, and the king sent a man from before him. But ere the messenger came to him, ere means before, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away mine head? Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door, and hold him fast at the door. Is not the son of his master's feet behind him? So he calls King Jehoram the son of a murderer. Ahab was a murderer. The Antichrist is also the son of a murderer. The devil who is a murderer from the beginning. And to top it off, Jehoram pictures the Antichrist because he also wants a prophet's head cut off. Jehoram wants Elijah's head. The Antichrist will want Elijah's head. Second Kings 6.33, And while he yet talked with him, behold, the messenger came down unto him, and he said, Behold, this, e this evil is of the Lord. What should I wait for the Lord any longer? Jehoram, he wants Elijah dead. He doesn't understand that the blame shouldn't be on Elijah. It should be on his own father. But you see how uh, rough things can get really fast. These people were going to eat asses' heads, killing their own children and eating them because they're so hungry. And that pictures today there's a famine in the land. Not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So this has been some ways that, been some things you can do so that you don't lose your edge.